grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. Turn and become like a child. As I mentioned to the kids a moment ago, Jesus tells His disciples to do this in our gospel reading today, but it begs the question, even to our modern ears, what exactly does Jesus mean when He tells His disciples to turn and become like this child? Well, first off, we need to clear up a bit of cultural confusion. You see, our current culture views children in a very different way than they were viewed at the time that Jesus was walking the earth. We sort of cherish children, we view them as cute and innocent and lovable, and they're, they hold up kind of, are held up sometimes even as examples for adults to follow in their joy and in their simplicity and in their happiness. Not so in the ancient world. Children in almost any of the ancient cultures that you would study are never viewed as anything for adults to emulate. In the pagan world, they get treated perhaps the worst. If they don't show up out of their mother's womb perfect and without blemish, in many cultures they were abandoned and left to die, or treated as sacrifices to assuage the wrath of angry gods. And even among the Jews, while children were not treated that poorly, they weren't really seen as admirable members of society that adults should look to for any sort of insight in how they should behave. In one of the commentaries I read in preparation for the sermon, they summed it up this way. In themselves, children, however, are ignorant. They're unfit to rule. They cannot choose between good and evil. They're not able to count They cannot defend themselves, and they are readily deceived. So in the Gospel of Matthew, there are four Greek words that Matthew uses to refer to children, and the one used here is called paideon. And the connotation of this word is generally a negative one. For example, it would be as if I said to you, you're behaving like a child. You don't really like it when somebody tells you that because in this instance, child doesn't mean happy or innocent or carefree. It means you're behaving in a way that children behave, but adults should not. Well, the use of this term is reflective of the general feeling about children in Jesus' day, that they're helpless, that they're whiny and utterly dependent on others to nurture, heal, and care for them. So again, I put to you Jesus saying to His disciples, truly I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. Feels a little different now, doesn't it? Turn and become like children. You can see the offensive nature of what Jesus is saying here. He's telling a bunch of grown men to behave like children something that normally would have been said in the context of an insult. And yet here, Jesus is serious about what He means. So what exactly is Jesus asking of His disciples? And consequently, what is He asking of you and of me? He's asking that you repentantly abandon any thought to worldly power and greatness and any delusions of self-sufficiency. It is, after all, only the poor in spirit, those who believe they have nothing and that God offers them everything, who are blessed in this new kingdom. It is only those who let go of pride and acknowledge one's abject need for grace and to become hopelessly dependent on God to receive it. That is what Jesus is calling us and His disciples today to do to turn and become as one who has nothing to offer and who needs everything. So let's get back to the disciples' question that started this whole discourse off. Because as I shared with the kids, the question doesn't seem to have anything to do at first with the answer that Jesus gives. And that question was, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? 
Well, if you're thinking that the disciples should start to become like children, they're off to a great start, arguing amongst themselves, a bunch of adult men, about who's going to be the best. And then they come to their teacher and say, Jesus, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? Not the sort of question and argument you expect to find between a bunch of grown men, and yet often you do. And even if they're not voicing it out loud, we're all in our minds asking ourselves this question all day long. And not even really about the kingdom of God, but just this world. Well, the disciples are like Pideon, even when they're not trying to be. But maybe you've been in a similar situation where you've asked a question, and instead of answering the question, the person you ask tells you that that is not a very good question to ask in the first place, that it's a bad question because it comes from a place and it expresses a desire that is wrong on its own and is going to lead you down a wrong path if that's where you begin. Well, this was a bad question for the disciples to ask because it expresses a wrong desire. Think about the desires that are expressed in this question of the disciples. Greed, selfishness, They're talking about the kingdom of heaven, but all they can think about is their place in it. Covetousness. They want to have more than the other. By whatever standard they wish to apply, they were the first called. They've done the most for Jesus, or so they think, whatever it may be. And envy are all wrapped up in this question. It's a bad question. So Jesus' response is not to answer the bad question, but to address the bad desire which spawned the question in the first place, that they've got a problem in their hearts about what they are looking at and what they desire. Remember, Peter last week is told by Jesus that he's going to go and suffer and die. And the first thing Peter does says is, far be it from you, Lord, that's not going to happen to you. And Jesus' response was, get behind me, Satan. Set your mind on the things of God rather than the things of men. And it's only a few chapters later, and here we are again. The disciples are like Pideon, even when they're not trying to be ignorant of what Jesus has come to do. And so they argue who is going to be the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Well, Jesus' answer, while maybe not answering the direct question, eventually shows them what they should be asking about, because Jesus endeavors to define what greatness actually is in this new kingdom He has come to establish. So what is greatness in the kingdom of heaven? Well, Jesus chooses an unlikely image to inform them of this new greatness they seek. He pulls a child, just a child that seemed to be around, and places him in front of him and begins to teach the disciples, a bunch of adults, that they should be like this child if they want to be great in the kingdom of heaven. You see, it turns out in the kingdom of heaven, greatness is something like this. It's defined as radical, lowly, childlike neediness. It's almost as if Jesus is saying, now which one of you wants to claim the title? Greatest. Because it means you're the one who has the least and needs the most. Whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Now, sometimes this is taken as you're supposed to humble yourself to serve others, and that is the greatness of the kingdom of heaven. But that's not really the case here. Jesus doesn't illustrate anything particular about this child. He just takes a child and says, to humble yourself like this child is to become poor in spirit, to become utterly dependent on God. That is the humility that is being talked about. It's not one who serves others, as good as that is. And if you think about it for a moment, or if you've had children of your own, child isn't really the best image for exemplifying one who serves another. Because despite the fact that we talk about childlike innocence, children really aren't innocent, and they need a lot of serving for them, not so much them serving for others, at least for quite a while. 
So humbling himself like this child means to acknowledge and confess a total dependence on the grace of God that is being brought forth in Jesus Christ. Well, after this verse, the discourse shifts a little bit. Who is the greatest has been answered. It's those with a radical, lowly, childlike neediness. And now Jesus continues teaching His disciples the error of their thinking, not only by how they should view themselves in the light of this revelation, but also how they're to interact with the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. He goes on and says, whoever receives one such child in my name receives me. So valued are the greatest in the kingdom of heaven, these lowly ones, that when you receive one of them, it is as if you're receiving Jesus Himself. Wow, that's quite the reversal from where the disciples' mindset began at the beginning of this chapter. And the rest of the gospel text for today and next week addresses and deals with at length how far the disciples are called to go, how far we are called to go in order to receive these greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Verses 6 through 10 focus on not making them stumble. Verses 12 through 14 go after them when they wander. Verses 15 to 20 try to gain them back by any means necessary from sin. And verses 21 to 35 forgive them endlessly. Now talk about getting into territory far afield from the original question the disciples have asked. I can imagine if I was one of them, I would be thinking, I'm going to think real hard before I ask a question next time (laughs) because I wanted to know who was going to be the greatest and now I found out I got a bunch of other stuff I need to do that I wasn't even thinking about before. But you still might be asking, what does all this mean for me? For me, a disciple of Jesus in 2023 at Ascension Lutheran Church in Pittsburgh. Well, this text gives the disciples of Jesus at any time and place two main takeaways. Rethink what it means to be great. Not only for yourself, but how you are to view the honor and value of the new greatest all around you. And the second is the goals of your life and conduct now change. Which makes sense if you think about it, because all the words that increase our striving towards certain goals, they're all words of greatness. Success, prestige, accomplishment, those are all pretty much synonymous with greatness. I want to become the best whatever. I want to become the person with the most whatever. That's why we get into that comparison and contrast game, because we want to measure ourselves against everyone else. And here Jesus says, in my kingdom, that isn't the way. In my kingdom, everything is laid bare, so if you really want to get into the comparison game, you'll find out you don't have anything. In my kingdom, you aren't aiming for the top. That was the problem with this question in the first place. You're looking out for what is the greatest in the kingdom of God, which seems to be by worldly vision and standards, those things and those people at the bottom. The children who need your care and nurture and undivided attention, and at least while they're still children, don't offer much in return for you. That is your relationship with God. He cares and nurtures and heals and helps you grow and saves you from all that would harm you. And in return, you give Him nothing. All of your righteous deeds and your great wealth or the accomplishments of your life are as dirty rags. But I don't want to leave you thinking I'm a worthless, whiny, needy child, because you are that. Yet, in the kingdom of God, you should hear that phrase differently. It should be part of the good news of Jesus that you hear today. Yes, 
you may still be uncomfortable with the idea of someone calling you a paideon, a child who's in need of everything. And you may say to yourself that you don't want to be that. I don't want to be utterly dependent on the care and help of someone else. But when you look throughout the Scriptures, and I'm going to give you a couple of references in Matthew, it is these paideon, the other places this, use, this word is used, to whom Jesus is revealed first. Matthew chapter 11, verses 25 and 26. At that time, Jesus declared, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and understanding and revealed them to little Pideon, children. Yes, Father, for such was your gracious will. Matthew 21, verses 15 and 16. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children, the Pideon, crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. And they said to him, Do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, Yes, have you never read? Out of the mouths of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. So yeah, you're a helpless, totally dependent child. But you're no longer in the kingdom of this world. You're in the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom that Christ is bringing into the world, has brought into the world through His death and resurrection on the cross, and being a helpless child in the kingdom of God it's not so bad. In fact, it's pretty great because God has come precisely for you to give you everything you need to make you the great ones in His kingdom, and also to call us to our fellow Pideon in the world who also need all the things we receive from Jesus as well. And in His abundance, He calls us to share with them so they can see this truth too, that He has come for them to call them His own and make them great in His kingdom. In the name of Jesus, amen.